hello. Can, oh, I think you can hear me. Uh, anyway, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, the basic message you're going to get from me uh, in a much more complicated way is that the solutions that we keep looking for in terms of how to be able to help close the wealth gap that we have, social mobility, poverty, all of those, that the solutions are actually embedded in the very communities of the people that we're trying to help and that what we need to do is get to that point. So I'm going to start um, by uh, giving you a little video that gives you some background and then we'll fill that in. So go ahead. I ran social services for 20 years and the system is set up that as you work and you do better, the resources go away. As I was getting older, that contradiction just didn't sit right with me. My parents were living in Mexico and my mother decided that to have a better life that you had to come to America and if you worked hard, you'd get the American dream. My mother sacrificed everything so that I could get into college. She worked two jobs and like so many people that come to work really hard, nobody would invest in her, nobody would trust her. I provided social services and tried to help people like my family for 20 years. All that existed was a social service program that was patronizing. My mother would never accept it, that kind of help. The mayor of Oakland, who is now the governor of California, Jerry Brown, called me up and said, if you could do anything you wanted to do and you really wanted to have an impact on poverty, what would you do? I realized I didn't know what to do, but my mother figured out what to do to get me out. And for that fact, I think most mothers, fathers, guardians would have a better idea how to get their own families out. So I started the Family Independence Initiative. I started collecting data from hundreds of families and found out maybe my mother's not so unique. This initiative was set up to really find out what the capacity was of families to actually help themselves and would they be willing to help each other. What Mauricio is saying is, I believe in the track record of these families and I'm going to invest small amounts of capital that they'll deploy according to their own sense and then he's just tracking the data to see how they make those investments. One thing I like about it, he's not doing nothing for you, but he's showing you, you can do this all by yourself. We're just providing you the resources to do so. Everything that I've wanted to do, I've always just sat back thinking about it. Mauricio has literally made me jump. Yes, this is very good and healthy, Vanya. You did such a great job with that cooking. For me, the biggest transformation has been to really step back and just be supportive or helpful and encouraging of what other people do. The power of change is embedded in these communities. For us, it really is, can you make visible what nobody sees? Watching your ideas and what you do, that's what inspires me, so thank you. So, um, <clears throat> so this is my mother and me when uh, we first came up from Mexico. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was two, so I never knew my father, but um, when she moved up here, she, you know, people would ask her uh, a little about herself, and she only had a third grade education, and being a Mexican immigrant, then everybody kind of took a stereotypical view of her in terms of a charity case. Uh, she actually was very talented. She was a wonderful designer. Uh, as it turns out, both my kids are designers. It must be in the genes, but um, nobody asked her about that. Nobody wanted to know what she was really good at. Nobody really... Um, would recognize the fact that she worked two jobs, that she did sewing on the side at, at midnight in order to sew uh, dresses for quinceañeras and she became a U.S. citizen. Um, my sister got in trouble when um, she was 16 when we first moved up here and so because of what happened to my sister then everybody again dumped on my mother that she must not have made the right decisions and there was something wrong with her but my mother got me through UC Berkeley and told me that I had I was the first one to college, so I either had to be a, a doctor or an engineer. And the um, problem was if I became a doctor, a lot of people would die. So <laughs> I decided to become an engineer. I wasn't a really good engineer, but, uh, so I had to leave it before too many people would die on that one. Um, and then I ended up entering the, the nonprofit sector, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But I think what really bothered me is that um, Life for my family and my mother and my sister and then her three kids was really, really difficult. And that my mother and my family did so much to sacrifice to get one kid out that after I lost my mother uh, in my mid-20s, 
because um, she had given up her health and everything in order to make sure that she could save for me. And she had designated that I was supposed to go to college and be able to take care of my sister and her three kids. And that what, uh, what actually was going on is that in order to save, my mother had given up her health care. She would not go to doctors. She would not spend any money. And um, by the time that I became an engineer, then I felt my obligation was now to take care of my mother, to get her the operations she needed, et cetera. My mother would argue with me that, no, my duty was to take care of my sister and her three kids, because my sister would be getting beat up all the time. And, um, and however, we were both pretty stubborn, and so she knew that at some point I was going to spend money. And about two weeks before I spent money to get an apartment for both of us, um, she went to Las Vegas, she bought a gun, and she shot herself. So for me, she, this is the way she won the argument. And people would say, well, she had mental health problems and whatever. You know, what people don't understand is the kinds of sacrifices that mothers and fathers and guardians make when you're poor. And we tend to classify them as passive, as not good decision makers, not good parents, because their kids are in trouble and whatever. And we don't realize how much they sacrifice. And actually, they should be honored for that. And that we should invest in the amount of resourcefulness and sacrifice that they make. And so that really is what happened, that after I lost my mother, I went into the war on poverty to, work, to run a nonprofit. And in that sector, within two months, then I realized that Actually, something was wrong with the whole sector. That what I was hearing running a nonprofit and what you will continue to hear is that about 15% of our population is stuck in poverty. Okay? And that it's 45 million people or 25 million children, or you just keep hearing these uh, people stuck. And the headlines all read that way. And I was growing up in these neighborhoods, and I'm over there, well, you know. So all these people that are stuck and not doing anything, where do they live? Because almost everybody I knew was working, and they were doing what my mother was doing. And so it just didn't make sense to me. And then the census studies came out that actually had been going on for a while, but everybody in the social sector, not only the right wing, but the social sector, actually had been hiding the fact that it's not 15% and that they're not stuck. The Census Bureau, and I went back to studies back to 2004, basically indicate that it's less than, two, less than 3% are stuck for more than three years, more than four years. That actually, that percentage is very low. And about half of the people that stay in poverty for more than three or four years have mental health problems and other problems that means they can't work. So if you think about it, that means that it's like exactly what I grew up is. Everybody's really working. They're working really hard. They're very stressed. Yes, there's drugs sometimes, and yes, there's trauma and crisis and whatever. But the fact is, the figures show that 97% of our population is actually moving in and out, and that the 15% is actually made up of people whose cars break down, a plant closes in their neighborhood, that it could be middle class folks, an illness happens, your hours get cut. These are the things of life when you're actually living on the edge, and that you don't have the resources to be able to make it over. And so, yes. If you actually lose your job at the potato, you know, my mother would be harassed by her bosses. And you hear a lot of that now. And I knew that when she would tell me that her boss started coming on to her, that she was going to quit. And then people would say, well, she's making a bad decision because she needs that income. But you, I think now you're hearing that. You can't survive that kind of situation. And so these were the situations that lead to all of a sudden you don't have income. You show as being in poverty. And when the Census Bureau does its cut and comes up with a 15%, it's made up of this mix of all these people, including middle class people. But we, in our sector, have basically accepted this whole notion that somehow or other, 45 million people are stuck. Admittedly, if they were stuck, then we should go save them. But if they're not stuck, then we're doing the wrong thing. That it isn't for us to save them. What it is is actually for us to back them in what they do. And so that's what the Family Independence Initiative was set up. It was to collect the data that would show us what people are doing that is right that they're working two jobs, what they're doing, what they're really talented in. And so for, for me, and when I started the project with Jerry Brown, it was to really take a cross-section of people in these communities and ask them a different set of questions. Often, when you hear of programs and whatever, the programs will ask, so what's wrong? You know, what do you need? You need, you don't have childcare, you don't have this. They never ask them, well, are you a talented dress designer? Are you actually saving money? Or what are these things that you're doing? 
So my project actually, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on it because actually it has started here in the county and I think Mary Lee is over there and she can explain how it actually works. But uh, it was really to discover really what people were doing to be part of that uh, set of people that get above poverty on their own. So you have a choice and these are not bad choices. The fact is there are 3% or 2% or whatever that are stuck and that have mental health problems and are in the midst of a crisis. When my sister got beat up, she actually had to somehow get welfare, get social workers, she needed somebody to help her. But a week or two later, she actually just needed some of the money that we were spending trying to help her in order for her to get a job so she could support her kids and be independent and not have to go to this guy that would beat her up. And of course, we promised never to hit her again. So the issue of trying to make poverty tolerable, it is important, but it does not address economic mobility or social mobility. That the only way, and if you've had teenagers or you've been a teenager, then, I think I got everybody, um, then, what you want to do is you want to identify your teenager's talents. You know, that yes, you need to feed them and shelter them. So that fundamental piece is still right. But just if you feed them and shelter them doesn't mean that they're going to do as well as they really could. So therefore, what you do is you look at what they're good at. So both my kids were good at design and art. And so we invested in it. So that's what we have to collect data about these families. Let's find out what they're really good at. And they show that often by what kind of jobs and work they actually do. So I'm going to tell you two stories. I told you that we started the project. Jerry Brown helped me start the project. My, my first, no, no, I'm sorry. This is before Jerry Brown. So before Jerry Brown, I ran social services for 20 years. Uh, Top-down services, we were considered one of the best in the country. Um, but my very first job in social service, I had left engineering because of losing my mother. My first job was to train 25 gang kids that were trying to get out of the gangs how to do construction. Uh, so they could get good jobs. And I had one training slot left on my first crew. And I knew two kids were coming in. One had just gotten out of jail, and his friend had not gone on the robbery. So you know, they both come in, and I had them fill out the application for, for the slot. And I told them that there was only one training slot left. And Richard, who did not want to be there, Richard was the one that just got out of jail, he actually smiled when he heard there was only one slot. He just assumed Ben, who was taking the initiative to come there, was gonna get the slot. So I looked at the, at the pieces of paper and uh, they were really similar. They dropped out of high school at about 16 and you know, they were part of the gang selling firecrackers and whatever. They, obviously it was not the, the heavy duty gang stuff. Um, but Richard had a criminal record. And so therefore when I came back out, I said, well, I have to give the training slot to Richard. And so they looked at me and said, well, why? And I said, well, Richard went on this robbery. He has a criminal record, and he's more in need. And my funding dictates that I serve the most in need. So Richard turns to his friend and he says, see, you should have gone on that robbery with me. <laughs> this is two months. I'm in my 20s. And what kind of message did I just send to these two teenagers? I would never want that message sent to me or to any kids that I'm raising. And this I did for 20 years. Basically. I had services that were always looking for the most in need. And so therefore, it was a race to the bottom. And my population had figured out it was a race to the bottom. So therefore, they could not depict themselves as talented. They could not depict themselves as having initiative or whatever. They had to de depict themselves as needy because that's the way they were able to get access to my services. And I had 120 staff, and I worked in two cities. The second story is after Jerry Brown. So with Jerry Brown, it was like, what would you do? Um, so that story goes that what would you do if you could do anything you wanted to do and you actually want to have an impact? At that point in time, he called all of us working in the nonprofit sector. This is, what, 1999 or something like that? 19, no, 2000. He called all of us poverty pimps, that we were actually making a living from the fact that people were poor and that we had had no fundamental change other than to actually make poverty tolerable, but not in terms of any mobility. And so he, he basically challenged me, because I was also disappointed with my work. He said, well, what would you do? And I said, well, I don't know what I would do, but I think um, my mother figured out how to get me out. So for that fact, I think most mothers, fathers, and guardians would have a better idea how to get their own families out. So what I would do is I would challenge them the way you challenged me. And I said, well, what would you do? And if you give me the data that shows me what you would do to get your own family's life better, then I'll pay you for the time it takes you to get me that information. And so that's what FII was set up to do. Now, 
there was no outcomes, there was no program. I told him, I'm not gonna have any social workers, because Carlos was all poverty pimps. So I'm not gonna have any staff give any advice or counseling. If any of my staff starts advising or counseling the families, I will fire them, okay? Because I wanted clean data. I was a bit of an engineer, and if my counselors are giving information, that means that I won't know the true capacity of the families. I told them the other thing is that the history in the United States is that people had 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 to work together. So whether it was the Irish, the Polish, African Americans built entire townships after slavery. 50 townships, black townships were built in Oklahoma alone. They had their own Wall Street, the black colleges. This was done with no programs, okay? So for me, it was, I feel like getting out of poverty is a group effort. And so therefore, I'm going to enroll families only with friends. No individuals, no individual families. They have to come in with a bunch of friends so we can see what scaling happened. How did these black townships get built? And so Jerry thought that was interesting, is interesting, so that's why he funded us. Now, six months into this project, remember, my staff could not give any directions, and they're over there, well, I don't know what's gonna happen, right? And we had a bunch of refugees, so I did not hire a bunch, I did not bring in families that have high energy levels or whatever. We brought in a, um, two groups that were primarily African American from East and West Oakland, this was started in Oakland, and then um, we brought a group of refugees from the war in El Salvador that had gone through that pretty traumatic war there. And in that grouping, there was one family, Javier and Maria, and they barely said anything. And one day my staff comes and says, you know, Javier and Maria are gonna buy a house. And we're over there, okay, well that's interesting because none of them have any savings, and all of it, anything that they can save gets back sent, to, uh, sent back to El Salvador in remittances. And then my staff says, <clears throat> and we think that the guy that talked him into buying this house is a predatory lender, so can we just talk to them a little bit or send them to financial training? And I'm over there, no, you know, no help. You know, I promised Jerry Brown that we would not help. And so it's like, and I'm a little weary about that, but I was still this data guy, right? So then it gets to closing, which is the only time he makes money. And so therefore he got him to closing, but their mortgage payment was 65% of their income. He put mortgage insurance and everything on it. And he was the broker. That's why he got it through. So my staff comes here, it's 65% of their income. They're going to lose the house. And I'm looking because the data we collect includes their income and expenses. And so I'm looking at this thing. And it's like, yeah, they're going to lose the house. Now, this time my staff is really pissed at me. So then it's like, well, you know, but people make mistakes. My mother made mistakes, and, and hopefully that community will learn not to use this guy again. So now the lessons start. So there were five other families. Remember, we only enroll people with their, fam with their friends. And so uh, two months after, oh, no, so then what ends up happening? I'm sorry. Um, Javier and Maria, somewhere along the line, realized that they were being taken by this guy. So they got a refinance clause built into their contract. And after the closing, they had all the friends they borrowed money from, remember, because they had no savings. So they had their friends descend on the house, repaint, retile, uh, and re-landscape the place. They got the value of the house up high enough that they asked me, because I still had some Spanish, to sit down on the refinance. They got their payments down to 40% of their income, and at 40% of their income with a whole group of friends surrounding this house, there was no way they're gonna lose the house, and they still own that house. So that was the first lesson, is they figured out a solution that my staff could never have come up with. Then the second lesson was that two months after Javier and Maria saved their house, the red line for savings, remember we track data, the red line for savings from all the other five families start going up. And so this time I went to the meeting because we would meet with the families once a month to understand what, what they were doing. And so then um, I asked them, so you guys had not been saving, now all of a sudden all of you are saving, so why are you doing that? And so they turned over to Javier and and says, if they can buy a house, we can buy a house. 18 months later, all five families owned homes in the United States. And then they start telling me that there was a ripple effect, that other people in that Salvadoran community that had never thought that they could actually have an asset in the United States, that they actually could end up buying hose and building assets. And so then, at that point in time, um, I felt like, well, that's really great. And that was 15 years ago. So last year in December, I did this presentation at Stanford. And I said the story about Javier and Maria. And at the end, people walk up to you, and there was a young Salvadoran man comes up to me. And he says, so you know, my mother heard about your family's buying homes, and so our family bought a home, and it is the equity from that house that got me through Stanford. So there had been generational change, okay? And if we had gone and saved that one family, it would never have happened. 
So that's sort of what I'm trying to tell you is that these are things that are going on all the time. So for us, one of the things is to try to get families to actually take power. We have convinced entire generations that they don't have the capacity to do it and they should wait for our solutions because that's what we're coming up with is a lot of solutions. And that what we have to do is actually take a different role. Rather than leading, we have to learn how to follow. We have to learn how to be supportive of what people are doing for themselves, and especially when they start working together. And so these are some of the quotes and some of the stories that are in the book. And what I want to remind you is sort of what Martin Luther King came to, which is sort of my frustration at this point in time, which is basically that we can deal with the people that are you know, really clearly racist and, and sexist, and, uh, and it's somewhat easier. It was always easier for my mother to deal. It was really hard for her to deal with the people that were trying to be nice to her. But it is much, much more frustrating. And so that's basically what Martin Luther King was saying about a lot of the white minister, but now it's people of any color that it's much more frustrating if you don't understand people's lives. And so what basically this initiative does is take us back to how the townships were built, how Harlem was built, the Chinatowns, the black townships we burned down. We did not burn the Chinatowns. We did burn down all the black townships. So this is something that is not an immigrant thing. It is something that's just inherent in people that they actually want to do better by themselves and everybody else. And that the scaling happens the way Javier and Maria, which is natural solutions are the ones that'll spread the most quickly and actually can bring the kind of change that we get. So I'm gonna leave you. This is some of the stats of the families in San Francisco. Their income has been going up uh, in very short period of time. Savings goes up, lending circles are all over the place now. I think this was a while back. They're accumulating about $1.7 million. They're doing a lot of things. And so what you need to be really conscious about is that if you're coming in as an outsider and you're trying to be helpful, you have to be really clear that you are likely reducing self-confidence unless you're able to validate what the people themselves are taking. So it's a whole other, so go talk to the people that are washing the dishes in the back, to the gardeners that are on. If you find out a little bit about their lives, start breaking down that these are the same folks that you think are stuck in, as the 45 million people. And that what you need to do is actually be able to see people, sorry, see people the way they actually want to be seen. Okay, so that's it, thank you.